Welcome to the next episode of the Brain Surgeons Vlog. And this week, what I'm going to talk to you about is something that lots of medical students in particular have asked me about before. And that's why do neurosurgeons continue to do what they do, despite the fact that a lot of their patients can sometimes have some really bad outcomes, despite our best efforts. So stick with me, I'm gonna be talking about this in a bit more depth, and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Most doctors go into medicine in the hope that they'll be able to cure patients, fix their problems, give them a better quality of life. Cardiologists can fix patients' hearts. They can do angioplasties or unblock the blood vessels going to their hearts. General practitioners can address risk factors in large patient populations and stop a patient from ever needing to go to hospital in the first place. General surgeons can cut cancers out of patients. They can improve people's quality of lives by fixing hernias and all sorts of other problems. Vascular surgeons can replumb the blood vessels going to people's legs and really give them a better quality of life. But neurosurgery has got this stigma attached to it, that no matter what we do as neurosurgeons, our patients are always going to be worse off. But that's not true. The urban myth is that if you've ever got the misfortune to see a neurosurgeon, whether it's in clinic or in the emergency department, it's probably already curtains for you. Or whatever surgery that we're going to perform is so high risk that the patient's going to end up really worse for wear anyway. A lot of this is down to three separate factors. The first is that a lot of people don't realise that spine surgery makes up 50% of our workload as neurosurgeons. We can treat lots of different spinal conditions, whether that's relieving pressure from a nerve caused by a disc, and that might have been causing a patient sciatica. There are all sorts of other spine surgeries that we do for the lower back, the thoracic back, and the neck as well. That's a huge proportion of our workload as neurosurgeons, and the outcomes are often very good from this. The second factor is that neurosurgery is a really young specialty. It's only been a separate specialty for about 120 years. Modern medicine has only really allowed neurological surgeons to operate safely and efficiently for about 100 years, so we're a bit behind in that respect. And the third and probably the most important factor is that the brain and spinal cord are not forgiving. What do I mean by this? The brain and spinal cord don't have the same regenerative capabilities as other organs in the body, especially as we get older. A lot of times, once damage has happened to certain parts of the brain and spine, those functions may not ever come back again. But if they do, they're not usually 100%. Let's take a brain tumour for example. People can often live with a brain tumour for a very long time and not know that it was ever there. The only time that they'll become aware of it is when the brain starts to decompensate or really start to struggle with having that extra object in the skull that shouldn't be there in the first place. It's often when it's grown to a size that the brain can no longer tolerate and that's the time when it needs to be treated. Again, it's really important to realise that there are lots of different types of brain tumours and I'm just generalising here. People never focus on brain tumours that are benign or that live on the outside of the brain and start pushing the brain inwards. These can still carry quite a good deal of risk to remove with an operation, but, but they can be removed with less risk than let's say a brain tumour that's lying deep within the brain that's pushing on lots of different important nerves and structures. And these are the kinds of nerves that are vital for you to be able to see, taste, touch, feel and even breathe. Often we try our best to remove these tumours without causing any major problems, and a lot of the times that is the case. But sometimes it's not safe to remove everything, so we'll leave a tiny bit of it left in there that can be treated by alternative and newer methods that are much less invasive than a surgeon going into the brain. Sometimes, no matter our best intentions and the best skills from the best neurosurgeon, when the patient wakes up, they'll sometimes be left with major or severe problems. And a patient will often be left with those symptoms and have a very long road of rehabilitation in front of them. And this can be really frustrating, not only for the patient, but also for neurosurgeons too. Sometimes tumours can be highly aggressive and have no cure. 
but thankfully that's actually a small proportion. Those kinds of tumours require a lot of highly specialised input, not from neurosurgeons, but from a multidisciplinary team, including physiotherapists, occupational therapists, speech and language therapists, oncologists. Unfortunately, a lot of the times patients will only see these highly aggressive forms of brain tumours in the media, and so, and rightly, they'll think that if you're diagnosed with a brain tumour, that's all it can be, but that's not the case. We'll often hear stories of very young patients with incurable brain disorders and brain tumours that leave them disabled and dead within months to years. Or we'll hear about blood vessels that have ruptured when somebody's just doing, going about their daily business and they've died before they've even come to hospital. Thankfully, this is not as common as you'd be led to believe. I'm not saying that we don't see a good deal of this. The stereotype has got to come from somewhere, but what I'm trying to say is that it's not all bad. There are lots of success stories in neurosurgery as well. There have been many lives that have been improved, many lives that have been saved. It's just not as common as in other specialties where sometimes the risks are not as high. And I'm not saying that of all specialties, but neurosurgery is definitely one of those specialties where the risks are often a lot higher. None of this takes into account the huge progress that we've seen in much less invasive ways of treating all of these disorders, whether that's gamma knife for brain tumours or endovascular treatment, which is treating blood vessel disorders or problems from within the blood vessel through a groin puncture, for example, rather than taking a piece of skull off of someone's head to get access to the brain. We look over surgery that we perform for pain syndromes, like trigeminal neuralgia, for example, or surgery for Parkinson's disease or intractable epilepsy. This is what pushes many neurosurgeons to be better, to operate better, push technology and innovate, so that we can get better outcomes for our patients. First and foremost, it's what makes us want to be better communicators with our patients. Because apart from all of the technology and innovation and amazing surgical skills, you need to be able to talk to people. And often that's one of the most fundamental processes that a neurosurgeon has to learn before anything else. So, what's the take home message here? Yes, neurosurgery has its unfair share of bad outcomes. But despite this, we can still do a lot of good for our patients. Neurosurgery is a young specialty and it has a long way to go before it can provide the cures and good outcomes that we would expect for all of our patients. To put this into context, a hundred years ago, your risk of dying from having a simple brain tumour removed from your brain was about 50%. We would have to flip a coin to determine whether you would survive your operation or not. Now, the risk is about 1%. And if you're a medical student who's been questioning your desire to pursue neurosurgery, maybe this has been helpful for you. Remember guys, if you want to keep seeing vlogs like this and all the other brain book content, don't forget to subscribe, like, and share. We'll see you next week.